you very much for this invitation and thank you Peter for such beautiful introduction. And uh, before starting uh, with the talk in itself, I would like to present uh, the historical context uh, for the Chinese events regarding the overthrow of the last dynasty of the Qin. The Qin dynasty means pure, clear, and it was of Manchu origins and the ruling elite uh, family was of the Xinjiang. They came to power in 1644 and during the 70th and 80th centuries they gathered the momentous history. Because in that period the Qin sized the territory corresponding to nowadays China except for Taiwan. And the population grew doubled from the moment of uh, their ascension to the throne to the end of the 17th century, 18th century. Sorry. There was economic prosperity, technological advancement and flowering of arts. But the 18th century also saw the growth of limitation, essentially two. In 1724, the emperor Kansi banned Christianity that was introduced by the Jesuits, which arrived in China at the end of the 16th century. Just to remember, the most important figure is Matteo Ricci, that is the first foreigner to be granted the privilege to be buried in Beijing. The second limitation is that one of the overseas trade that was limited in 1757 in the south port of China in Canton. And there was, however, an exception, that one of the Russians, through which they bordered, so they established land borders and they established trade treaties. So this measure proved that the Qin dynasty was at its apex of glory, but tried to mobilize things. So whereas the 19th century was completely different, it was a troublesome century. So there was a series of natural disasters, such as droughts and flooding, causing famine, banditry and revolts, such as, for example, that one of the yellow turbans, that is the Muslim population that is still is in Xinjiang, still a hot topic for central government Beijing, and in the southwest regions. Or that one of the Taipei, that uh, it was the heavenly kingdom of the Taipei, which the central government took 12 years to crush down, to which we should add the pressure from the outside, the arrival of the Western powers engaging to wars with China, uh, using the opium as a pretext to open up the country to trade, but which at the end made the Qin to crumble. So, the second half of the 19th century was made of conflicts, payment of massive indemnities, ransacking the Chinese treasury, and the capacity to face internal problems that I just mentioned. The result was disastrous. The Chinese people felt more and more alienated and perceived the Manchus as no longer entitled to have the heavenly mandate or legitimacy to rule and trust by heaven to the emperor, since he was considered the son of heaven, the bound between heaven and earth. So, Moreover, the foreign origin of the ruling dynasty made them even a bitter target of the mounting discontent. Politically, there were two factions, the reformists and the revolutionaries. The reformers aimed at reform the dynasty into a constitutional monarchy, and it was the prominent current until the reactionary backlash by the Empress Dowager Cixi in 1898, which had the reforms implemented by her nephew, the Emperor Guangxu, who was part under house arrest and died, and would die 10 years later, just one day before his beloved aunties. Just for your knowledge, in 2008, they proved that in her deathbed, the Empress Dowager Cixi made poison him in order to allow her faction to be in power again after her death. Lovely auntie. So the last emperor, such as depicted in Berton, uh, Bernardo Bertolucci's movie in, 90, in 1987, was Puy, a child of almost three years old of age when he came to power, who abdicated four years later in 1912. And he resided in the Forbidden City until 1924 before moving to Tianjin. So, the winning faction was that one of the revolutionary of the Alliance Party led by Sun Yat-sen, the winner. But let's start. Well, a republic for China and Ireland, a new beginning. Ireland played an important role in the end of the British Empire. Although its destiny was at stake at the beginning of the 20th century, just two decades later, the world scenario had changed for good, and the island of Ireland, with the exception of the majority of the province of Ulster, was a new established state, the Irish Free State. 
later the Republic of Ireland. The events of this epochal achievement were amongst the irreversible change, changes that the world faced the end of World War I. At the turn of the century, many dynasties were on their thrones, just to mention some, the Habsburg in Austria-Hungary, the Romanovs in Russia, the Ottomans in Turkey, and the Qin in China. But the Great War changed the scenario. All those just mentioned were overthrown and their places new states. All of them new republics were established. We should also add the British crown, which survived but in some amputation Ireland was lost. At the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, the discussion brought to the forefront of the malaise of many subjugated peoples. Racial discrimination was still rampant and the unequal treatment by the winners was evident despite the fact that the peace negotiation would establish one of the most modern institutions, the League of Nations, the forerunner of the United Nations. The Irish cause was debated at the 1919 Peace Conference and it immediately drew attention to the different treatment reserved for the Irish and the Koreans, whose subjugation to their dominator was recognized versus the freedom <coughs> granted to Poles and Hungarians. In fact, the Paris Peace Conference was a watershed in the Irish question because in the early 20th century, the vast majority of Irish nationalists supported John Spradman's Irish Parliament Party, who were content to regard Home Rule, the devolution of limited powers, to an Irish assembly rather than full independence, as a satisfactory resolution, whereas the post-war events in Ireland might be seen as part of a wider pattern with which saw the emergence of independent nation-state from the wreckage of the empires in Central and Eastern Europe as ideas such as self-determination and popular sovereignty replace discredited notions of empire. In the same context, the Chinese, of all a country run by its national, was trying to gain equality of treatment with their allies, which it helped on the European front during the fiercest battles. Despite all the efforts made by the Chinese, nothing was recognized, such as the end of the unequal treaties imposed by the Western powers and Japan in China, on China, at the time, it seemed more, both Ireland and China were destined to continue under the colonial and semi-colonial status. The common fate shared by the Irish and the Koreans is also associated with their battle to overthrow their rulers. And the initial refusal received the Paris Peace Conference under the Article 10 of the League of Covenant. China was in a slightly different situation. Although it independent, it was struggling to remove the foreign presence imposed on its national soil by the principle of extraterritoriality. China, while technically an independent country, accepted that foreigners were ruled and tried by the law enforcing their own countries. Despite this state as a semi-colonized country, China transformed itself from the Middle Kingdom into the first, the Republic of China, the first in Asia in 1912. The Xinhai Revolution, which started on the evening of the October 9th, 1911 Wuhan was a successful attempt after a long seri series of failures. The revolutionaries of Sun Yat-sen, the posthumous proclaimed father of the country and esteemed by both nationalists and communists still nowadays, had achieved an epochal charging target, giving hope not only in Asia, primarily to the neighboring Koreans, but also in Europe. The Irish did not ignore the events evolving in China and learning from the experience. The Chinese events of the 1911 revolution were preceded by almost two decades of political turmoil and faint attempts at reformation by the ruling Manchu dynasty, which ended up too little too late. Moreover, China was considered after the Boxer Rebellion of 900 the Menon to be carved up by the Allied powers. And once again, the spoil was another war indemnity <coughs> to be extinguished by 1940, as well more territorial expansion by the foreigners and so forth and so on. The events that I just mentioned are intended to capture the elements of comparison between the history of China and Ireland during the first two decades of the 20th century. Whenever the references to China are mined, the references to the Paris Peace Conference are a point raised by Robert Erskine Childers. The famous Irish nationalist that imported the weapons from Germany to Ireland on board of his yacht as guard on July 1914, before he ran the Irish volunteers from Hove on the 26th July. In December 1990, when he moved 
his family from London to Dublin to become an active member of the Second Diet, after the signature of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, he published the article Law and Order in Ireland in the Studies an Irish Quarterly Review issued by the Irish Province of the Society of Jesus. This point is very important to understand the value of the Chinese Revolution, the Easter Rising, and their legacy in the 20th century, both at national and international levels. But let's start in order, a chronological thought not too strict to order. The Xinhai Revolution. In China, as in Ireland, the triggering factors of the uprising were more accidental than planned. In fact, the fall of the Qin was triggered by an accidental bomb explosion in Hankou, nowadays a district of Wuhan, Hupei province, on October the 9th, 1911. The explosion occurred while a group of revolutionaries were making bombs at their meeting house in the Russian concession in Hankou. The Qing investigators raided the headquarters and found three revolutionaries who were executed immediately. They also obtained the membership registers of the soldiers and others enrolled in the revolutionary societies. The revolutionary understood that unless they could launch an uprising rapidly, their organization would be unraveled and many more members would lose their lives. On the following morning, the Wuchang 8th Engineer Battalion Mutine and in the early hours seized the munition depot. And the day after October 11th, members of the Revolutionary Societies launched a successful uprising in the 3rd district of Wuhan, Hanyang, and with the troops from the 1st Battalion seized the Hanyang Arsenal and Iron Works. The Hankou troops moved in on October the 12th. The Xinhai Revolution was the successful attempt after a dozen failed ones to bring down the Qin court. Therefore, the revolutionary led by Sun Yat-sen, although he was not present due to a tour of the USA in order to fundraise for his party, gathered around the Alliance Party and sparked an uprising that fortuitously had to achieve the so much agonized target. The successful uprising was observed in Anna with particular interest. In fact, the news of the outbreak of a revolution in China was widely reported by the Irish press. Although there was a unionist press in Ireland, most local and national Irish newspapers were constitutional nationalist in outlook. Such, for example, they tended to support the demand for home rule rather than republicanism. Republic of separatist newspapers were few in number and lacked circulation in press. So, on the morning of October 13th, the Irish Independent, the Friedman Journal and the Limerick Leader were the first to report the news of the events in China with the Freeman Journal dedicating three articles entitled The Latest Revolution, Proposed Republic, and Revolution in China. The enthusiasm in the articles is greatly evident, as the Irish Independent reported, I quote, The revolution in China is spreading rapidly. The cities of Wuchan, Hanyang, and Hankou have fallen into the hands of the revolutionary. The revolutionary general declares that the People's Army will overthrow the Manchu dynasty and receive the, uh, revive the rights of the Chinese." End of quote. It is evident how the language used embodies the Irish nationalist aspiration. Similarly, the Freeman Journal, the latest revolution, referred to the Beijing government affirming the quote, in the spirit of reform without the gift of political efficiency, there is a most disastrous combination. Peking has excited demand demands which is not competent to satisfy and has precipitated the always lurking and before now explosive discontent which menaces the whole ancient scheme of things." End of quote. The same journal also gave room to another important aspect, the establishment of a native government in the form of a republic. In fact, the title, Proposed Republic, Successes of the Rebels, Several Cities Captured, Safety of Foreigners, Summarize at best what outcomes the Irish nationalists hope to see take a firm shape in China as well as in Ireland in the near future. The Irish newspaper followed closely the development of the situation in China, and the Freeman Journal on the October 16 published an article entitled Peking Alarmed 25,000 Rebels Armed. Underline how the rebels were winning instead of the public authority factions report and how the revolutionary coast was fundraised by the revolutionary in the USA, which proves to be another parallel to the Irish nationalist cause. But the most impressive article appearing in the Irish press about the Chinese revolution is the article A National Awakening. 
publishing the Irish Independent on October 24th, which reports the impression of a certain Mr. Davidson, working in education for many years in China. He affirmed that the revolution was the result of education the example, and this reference might easily be influenced by Thomas Davis' Young Ireland idea, corresponding to the motto, educate that you might be free. Moreover, Mr. Davidson told an episode, and I quote, when an English teacher was pointing out with pride to a geography class at Chengdu the many red colored possessions of Great Britain, he was stopped by the shout of, you stole them, from his class. The, cl the example could not be more suitable to the Irish nationalist cause. The colonizer was an English teacher proud of the imperial achievements of Britain, and the whole Chinese class stood up in protest. In the very same article we read too, in the propaganda of the Revolutionary Party, a poster depicting the swallowing of Egypt by Great Britain played a prominent part. The feeling against foreign interference is very strong with young China. The struggle is not so much one of the mantra against Chinese as of constitutionalist versus bureaucrat and foreigner. It is a fight of China for the Chinese. So, the terms used in the excerpts are very close to the Irish nationalist. Young China refers to Young Ireland and intends to assimilate the Chinese cause with the Irish nationalist one. In fact, Young Ireland changed Irish nationalism in the mid-19th century, and some of its young members were founders of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. <coughs> this gave the author the opportunity to consider the Chinese events in a paternalistic way, and supported the Chinese cause as in line with the Irish nationalism. The final remark declaring China for the Chinese is also very powerful, that the whole rule was what Ireland sought shall get from the British. The same article also appeared in the Irish Examiner, as the new papers tended to reprint the same story sourced from international press agencies, but they may have added them differently for a variety of reasons. Yet the Irish newspaper, whether nationalist or unionist, tended to report foreign stories in a way that reflect their own political outlook and assumption, such for example nationalism and imperialism. Yet the conclusion of the Irish Independent and the Irish Examiner are different, because in the Irish Examiner we read, and quote, there is no doubt that the feeling against foreign interference, political and financial, is very strong with young China. I think then that the statement that the revolutionary outbreak is not anti-foreigner has to be examined before acceptance. In my opinion, the struggle is not so much one of Manchu against Chinese as of constitutional versus bureaucrat and foreigner. It is a fight of China for the Chinese. The Chinese have, however, learned wisdom and they will certainly nothing to bring about the very thing that they are rising against the intervention of the foreigner. In the sense that the foreigners will not be attacked, the outbreak is not anti-foreigner." Here there is a deeper analysis level than in the Irish independence. The revolution should be against the alien element of the government, but it should be carefully carried out in the order not to alienate foreign sympathy for the national cause. The damages of foreign third parties in the national revolution can trigger foreign help against the nationalist cause and provide vital help to the island government. Therefore, the Chinese, just as the Irish, should be careful not to attract intervention from outside the direct confrontation between them and the Manchu or the British. The newspaper making room for the Chinese news were the Irish nationalist press. While only 10 days after the outbreak of the revolution in China, the Donegal News, the Ulster Herald and Strabane Chronicle reported the events, but the Donegal News and the Ulster Herald reported it under a much more neutral title. Matter of the moment, using the same text and title which I read. A serious revolution has broke out in China and that the Manchu dynasty which has held sway in the Celestial Empire for over 200 years is likely to be overthrown, <coughs> and that we are to have a republican government established in the most populous empire in the world. It would appear that the leaders of the revolution in China are men of new ideas. 
who had studied the modern civilization in Europe and who had determined that their native land will have an opportunity of taking its place among the progressive nations of the world. So the text shows a neutral tone about the events while it stresses the modern education received by the leader of the revolution, Sun Yat-sen. However, no enthusiasm whatsoever. This is completely understandable as the Donegal News, the Ulster Herald and Strabon Chronicle were free of the newspaper owned by the Lynch family, owners of the North West of Ireland Printing and Publishing Company Limited, with a loyalist editorial policy. On November 4th, the Donegal News article reported that the revolution on a daily basis had a strong accent on a peace inside so that the Unionists might hope that if the uprising happened, a peaceful solution could come immediately after. In fact, it is interesting to see how diverse the opinion of these three newspapers from the Irish Nationalist one. In the article appear on November 18, 1911, the vision of the Ulster Loyalist is embedded by the hope of what should happen next in China. And I quote, Instead of the limited despotism which has prevailed in China, there will be substituted a strictly limited monarchy, in which all power will be in the hands of the parliament elected by the people. The revolutionists have evidently modeled their proposed government after the English constitution. Clause 8 of the new regulation says, Parliament shall elect and the emperor shall appoint the premier, who will recommend the other members of the cabinet, who also shall be appointed by the Emperor. Imperial princes should be ineligible as Premier, Cabinet Ministers or Administrative Heads of Departments. This shows a determination to keep Chinese royalty in its proper place and to make the Emperor and his relatives purely ornamental figures in the Chinese government of the future. So the Unionists hoped that China would be reformed and became a constitutional monarchy. And they did not only express their opinion frequently on the Chinese Revolution, they gave rooms to current affairs in China when Yuan Shikai attempted a restoration at his death and on related editorial articles entitled Monarchy vs. Republic. By January 1, 1912, the revolutionary process in China was over and the Republic of China was established. Its provisional president was Sun Yat-sen, Regarding the outcome of the Chinese Revolution, different views are expressed in the Irish press. From the moderate believing that a somewhat premature resolution to congratulate China on the success of the revolution will embrace the USA foreign policies as expressing the Irish independent, to complete silence by the loyalist press. However, the new circumstances raise new doubts about the financial aspects of the revolution and its outcomes in the minds of all those who followed the events, both nationalists or loyalists. In fact, as we can image, a number of articles about the Chinese revolution and its legacy continue to appear in the press in Ireland, but its frequencies decreased. Instead, the Irish national events were taking prominence in the Irish press, concentrated on the full home rule bill. So, just a little incursion on that. In late 1910, Prime Minister Asquith announced that a new Home Rule proposal would be presented. And in so doing, he returned the country to the very same situation of the first two attempts in, 19, sorry, in 1886 and 1893. In 1886, Balfour witnesses the most destructive riots where the police were the targets of the loyalists alongside the more familiar sectarian assaults on the Catholics. And in 1893, the Unionists threatened to resist the military, but the Liberal government and the Irish Nationalist Party dismissed the protest. According to their vision, Ireland was entitled to a nationalist self-government because the island of Ireland constitutes a natural, political, economic and administrative unit. So the protest against the Home Rules were considered illegitimate. Paradoxically, the Home Rule proposed by Gladstone aimed to pacify Ireland because Home Rule aimed at strengthening the Union by reducing the Irish discontent to a manageable level. But instead, the 1960 rebellion Easter was the direct consequence of its failure. As Charles Townsend writes, and I quote, in September 1914, the Government of Ireland Act would receive the Royal Assent through use of the Parliament Act. 
It was law, thought it was suspended until the end of the European war. And of course, the act could not be implemented without special provision for the North East Ireland, where Unionists and Protestants were a strong majority, while the Southern Unionists were a minority and could not contemplate action. The outbreak of World War I effectively froze the Home Rule question, as the leaders of the Irish Unionism and Irish nationalism strived to win influence with the British government by support, recruitment, and the war effort. The Unionists were still opposed in principle to Home Rule, but willing to put the war effort first. And many nationalists, particularly after Unionists entered the wartime coalition in 1915, feared that the Unionist opposition might still prevent Home Rule from being enacted after the war, or some other specified provision for the special treatment of the Ulster Guarantee. Prime Minister Asquith also got support for the war from John Raymond, the leader of the permanent section of the Irish Parliamentary Party, who secured the introduction of the Third Home Rule Bill and pledged the Irish support for Britain in World War I. So, the suspension of the Home Rule created a very difficult position for the Irish Parliamentary Party. The influence that it enjoyed from 1910, with the Liberals dependent on its support, disappeared as the main British party moved closer together eventually forming a coalition in 1915, in which prominent Ulster Unionists were given posts. Redmond was strictly badly by the government, which refused to allow the nationalist volunteers to be used for the defence of Ireland, or to form a specific division for them. And also the Irish economy did not benefit from the war spoil, since the War Office failed to award any significant contracts to the Irish firms. The continued suspension of Home Rule, Redmond's political importance and his continued support for a war that grew increasingly less popular in Ireland meant that his party was in a precarious position even before the Easter Rising. So, World War I returned cultural and physical violence to Irish politics. The conflict, the conflict reshaped the national composition in Europe and it produced violent ideological division as well as utopian projects. In Ireland, it froze the Third Home Rule Bill, splitting the Irish, Irish nationalists, who were facing the virtual elimination of, of unemployment in Britain through the vast expansion of the munition industry, not much in Ireland except for Belfast. Even by early 1915, the Irish Parliamentary Party had become politically unconvincing and its popular power base began to crumble. Although Raymond was invited to participate in a new coalition cabinet as minister without portfolio in May 1915, in the very same spring, his position was undermined, because it was clear that the war would be long and there was little English recognition of Ireland's contribution. To better understand the situation, we should take into account the role of the Irish Catholic Church concerning the war effort. The highest level of recruitment usually came from the urban areas as a form of employment, while in the rural areas recruitment was very low. The reason was that by raising food prices, World War I created prosperity in rural Ireland. Added to the reluctance of farmers to enlist, while in urban Ireland higher food prices created poverty, which partly encouraged enlistment in the British Army and also the Catholic Church played an important role in those areas. Many Irish church leaders had initially supported the British war effort, in sympathy with the Belgian Catholic population, where Catholic priests were targeted by Germans. But by mid-1916, they were becoming alienated by British rule in Ireland, and felt that the imposition of conscription without public support would be unjust. In fact, at the beginning of the conflict, the Catholic clergy had supported the Irish Parliamentary Party in relation to the war effort and recruitment. But in 1915, it changed its position because of Pope Benedict XV's encyclica, Alor que fumo, denouncing the conflict as non-Christian and appealing for peace, and for the fear of the French anti-clericalism reminiscent of the French Revolution. In April 1918, the church leaders guided the campaign against conscription to ensure that the movement stayed under control and did not descend into violence, as happened during Easter 1916. So, one week before the enactment of the conscription bill, the Irish bishops issued a statement warning 
warning the government against the proposed measure, while local Catholic churches became the center of opposition campaign. The conscription crisis cemented the rise of Sinn Féin, with the party's membership increasing by almost one third by mid-1918. The close association between the party's leader and the Catholic hierarchy added an important aspect of legitimacy to it. The opposition played by the Catholic Church to the war and to conscription, however, was balanced by a certain enthusiasm for the Irish Catholic mission abroad, especially in Africa and in Asia. This change of attitude towards the mission to non-Christian countries started in 1910, thanks to two French societies infiltrated in Ireland, which were able to revert the insularity of the Irish clergy and laity created by the French Revolution. So, this change of attitude by the Irish Catholic Church did not only invert that trajectory, but also divert intentionally the war effort and the opposition to this conscription into mission efforts in Africa and Asia. For instance, the Irish missionary magazines did not challenge the military war spirit, but the objectives, and they exhorted the young Irish Catholic not to enroll into the earthly arm, but into God's army. The native attitude was sanctioned by the Irish newspaper, which made acceptable the coverage of the missionary affairs, such as in the Irish Catholic, the Universe, Tablets and others. And on November 11, 1916, three articles in the Irish press, especially in Donegal News and Southern Star, reported the news that the new president of the Republic of China was a Christian, and a Catholic one at like that. Li Yong Hun, his private secretary and the Minister of Foreign Affairs were all fervent Catholics, according to the sources. Li Yong Hun, and I quote, soon showed his remarkable statesmanship and diplomacy by uniting all the disaffected provinces under the Republic, a great soldier and a great statement. He combines all the qualities of a strong ruler. He led the Republican army in the revolution of 1911, and since then has devoted his great military and naval talent to building up the Chinese army and navy. Under such a ruler, China must advance by great strides towards modern civilization." End of quote. As the article, President of China Catholic, published in the Donegal News, Monster Express, Southern Star and Fermanagh Hero, the reported, and I quote, these facts are particularly interesting at the present time, when Ireland is looking so much to the Christianization of China, and especially in connection with the Irish missionary movement, which was started at Maynooth in October. The Irish Apostolic Mission to China, composed by a band of young Irish priests, aimed at preaching the gospel to the Chinese, and with the approval of the bishops, Father Glowick and seven other missionaries started the apostolic works. So they established a Chinese mission in Ireland to prepare young men who were desirous of becoming missionaries in China, and so an Irish ecclesiastic college was funded. The Irish National Mission to China was a cause promoted in Ireland by the clergy and the press, which aimed at establish a larger widespread organization in China, later called the Menuf Mission to China, provided for by priests trained in Ireland and later also by Irish Catholic community in the USA for the Columban Fathers. The Holy See assigned to the Irish Catholic Church a province for the missionary activity, and the Maynooth mission to China was based in the Hubei province, with its quarter in Wuhanyang, precisely one of the three districts from where the Chinese Revolution took place in 1911. As estimated by Mr. Ignatius Inchi, Chinese professor at San Columbus College, the capital Hanyang at the time had a population of around 600,000 inhabitants approachable by large ocean liners because it was one of the largest river ports on the Yangtze, the mission needed to find priests to preach to five million Chinese, to divide the province into workable parishes, build churches, provide education for the Chinese, and establish a college for the native priests, among other duties. The menu mission to China became the trope of Irish nationalism in China. Although the arrival of the first 16 priests from Manuf was expected in March 1921, 
The Menuf mission to China was a topic of discussion in Anna from 1916, when the mission was established. So, between the Easter Rising and the birth of the Irish Free State, as Hogan writes, the Irish missionary literature carefully Monsey's argument they did not decry the tents of Ireland to free herself from British dominion. On the contrary, the cause, the cause of Irish independence was praised as something good, sacred, holy and dear to God. Freedom, it was argued, was the object for which the Republicans were fighting. Freedom of a spirit, spiritual order, a higher freedom, was the object of the fighters on the mission. Thus a common objective, differing only in a degree. A common idealism was at the root of both struggles. So, in any case, the ordinary Irish men remained faithful to their earthly cause and became involved in the Easter Rising. So, as for the Chinese 1911 revolution, the British authorities came to know the preparation of the Irish uprising before it took place, and this was one of its triggering causes. <coughs> In fact, for the British, the stand of the World War I represents an excuse to postpone the solution of the Irish question. But the Easter Rising happened in the very middle of the conflict in 1916. If the Irish volunteers provided the means through which the Irish Republican brothers could execute the rebellion, the outbreak of the War I in August 1914 provided the opportunity and the organization was determined to have a rebellion in Ireland before the end of the war. According to Fergus McGarry, the most disputed aspect of 1916 remains whether the organizers believed that they were likely to be successful or whether they acted in the knowledge that there was little prospect of victory. The decision to rise again during the war was rational from the Irish Republican Brotherhood perspective. The rising, the rising coincided with a big German offensive in France diverting British forces, then later they could compare the enemy to negotiate, but also in case of defeat, providing that the Germany won. The Irish would be able to claim recognition at the peace conference at the end of the war. So, as a well-known motto says, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. In the Irish context, this became the Republican motto of England's difficulty is Ireland's opportunity and the Germans could be the possible ally. This opportunistic attitude was adopted by many who were pro-German insofar as Germany was Britain's enemy. And we could have been pro-anything else that would oppose the ancient tyrant that held our country in bondage through the centuries, as stated by Joseph Lawless. A member of the Irish volunteers who took part in the Easter Rising. In this way, anti-recruitment finally overlapped with pro-German sentiment. The, the Irish Volunteer Military Committee in charge of the preparation for the rising also had to secure German military support and communicate with the German authorities to whom the Ireland report was submitted, outlining how the German support could facilitate a successful rebellion. The strategy was so a combination of efforts made by the German U-boats with the Irish volunteers preventing reinforcement arriving from Britain. In April 1915, Plunkett and Roger Casement travelled to Berlin in an effort to convince the German government that their plans were su su sufficiently serious and well advanced to be worth consideration by the German government. In addition to arming the rebels, it was hoped that Germany would also send a military force to participate in the rising. Kesmet was also involved in the raising an Irish brigade from Irish soldiers who had been captured by the German army while fighting for the British during World War I, a mission that met with very little success. It soon became clear that Germany had no intention of taking part in an invasion and was only prepared to provide one shipload of captured second-rate rifles. In fact, the proposal was rejected by the German general staff and foreign office either because the rebels were not taken sufficiently seriously or because naval consideration has made such an operation unpractical. Despite the case man's intention of conviction, the military to call it off, the Easter Rising began on Monday 24, 1916 in Dublin. And you all know what happened. But for the uprising itself had been unpopular with most of the Irish people, 
The execution of the leader excited a wave of revulsion against the British authorities and turned the dead Republican leaders into martyr heroes. The Easter Rising signaled the start of the Republican Revolution in Ireland. The Irish Republic lasted one week and at the end of World War I, Ireland was still under British rule. Even if Germany had let the Irish nationalists down in the Easter Rising, the Irish nationalists still criticized the British by diminishing them against Germany. In the 1918 general election, Sinn Féin won a large, large majority in Ireland and thus could claim a democratic mandate for its <coughs> demand on an Irish Republic. When the Irish Assembly was established on January 21, 1919, in order to elect the representative of the Irish nation, the British banned it because they considered it illegal. And the subsequent wave of arrest without warrant of the Irish Republican was described by Erskine Child with the following words. The police and military carried out an armed raid upon the dais office and arrest every male person upon the premises indiscriminately and without warrant. The three, three were members of parliament, but all alike were hustled off to jail in lorries crammed with soldiers in World War II. We must take a wide view of the history to find a parallel of four Ds. Germany has nothing like it to her credit. Another important reference to the Irish attitude toward Germany is the opinion of James Connolly, who described Germany as a civilized, older country more modern than Britain. He did not mention the major role played by Germany in the outbreak of the war, and he dismissed the German brutality in Belgium as propaganda, and argued that the Germany was in German party. Connolly's attitude is the most pro-German compared with other Irish patriots, such as Tom Kettle, who separate themselves from Connolly's vision, maintaining that Irish nationalists had to support the British effort after witnessing firsthand the arms purchased for the Irish volunteers from the Germans. In any case, Germany could have been the Irish ally, but Germany was undoubtedly the enemy of China. So, during World War I, China ended the entered the conflict on the side of France and Great Britain, and even if the, Brit the Chinese did not fight, they served as coolies for the Allies on the French and British front. And the fact that they declared war to Germany in 1917 granted them the right to participate at the Paris Peace Conference in 1990. However, this proved to be a bitter dash for their effort. Moreover, during the conflict, China had to face two big issues linked to the international order the 21 demands and the Shantung question. In the power vacuum created by the civil unrest during the World Lords period and the presence of two national governments hostile to each other, one in Beijing and the other in Canton, both claiming to be the legitimate one, Japan presents 21 demands to China, demonstrating its aggressive politics. And Japan requested in regard to the Shantung province that China would consent to all matters that they may agree upon between the Japanese and the German governments, as well as open the principal cities of Shantung to foreign trade. In fact, Japan had declared war on Germany in August 1914 and had immediately followed up by attacking the German concession in Shantung province. On November 7, 1914, Japanese forces captured Qingdao. China urged that Chinese, tro Chinese troops should be used against the Germans and tried to get the British to concur. But the British were content to allow the Japanese to go ahead with this planned expansion on Chinese soil because of the Anglo-Japanese alliance signed in 1902 that aimed at opposing growing Russian power in East Asia. At that point, China felt betrayed by the British ally, who had secretly agreed to the Japanese status quo in China. When World War I reached its climax in Europe, the Chinese Premier Quan Chin Rui decided that China had to join France and Great Britain against Germany, because in case of victory, China could claim back the German concession areas in Shantung province. China's position was endorsed by the USA, which decided to enter the war in April 1917 to neutralize German submarine attacks in the Atlantic, but also because Japan bribed the French regime to recognize its position in North China at Germany's expenses. 
Moreover, China's military strength was trivial, but he had manpower, which was a crucial resource for their allies. The slaughter of the European battlefields had cost France and Britain 600,000 men at the Battle of the Somme, and the latter would also lose more than 250,000 men in the Battle of Ypres in 1917. The arrival of the Chinese laborers in Europe allowed the Allies to have more European male active for combat. The second issue is the Shantung question. China abandoned its neutrality and declared war on Germany on August 14, 1970, so it recovered the German concession at Tianjin and Hankou and seized German property, only part of which was returned to its owner after the war. The Shantung question is also an important factor to be analyzed, because after the Eastern Rising, the Irish nationalist propaganda was not only anti-English, but pro-German. But how can this attitude be seen and analyzed in the Shantung question? When Japan was the aggressor and tried to seize the region from the national territory at the expenses of the Germans? Let's read. The Irish independent on February 25, 1915 wrote, Since the fall of Kyaujo, there has been no small curiosity as to what Japan would do with regard to the territory which Germany had on the list from China. Reports were spread abroad that Japan had made a number of demands upon China which could not be admitted. But what these were could not be certain. Last Thursday, the Unionist member for Wheeler sought information on the subject from Sir Edward Gray, but the Foreign Secretary reply was that he could not communicate to the House of Commons the information which had been given to him confidentially by the Japanese government. London merchants who have large business dealing with China discussed on Tuesday what they had heard of the Japanese demands from the point of view of their possible effect upon British trade interests in China. They were naturally anxious to be assured and that any arrangement between Japan and China would be consistent with the principle of the Anglo-Japanese Treaty, that the independence and integrity of China and the quality of commercial opportunity should be preserved. The London merchants intend to put their views before the government, but in the meantime the text of the Japanese demand is withheld. Undeniably, the Japanese kept to the letter of their agreement with Great Britain in their part they took in clearing Germany out of the Paris. In the Irish Independent of May 6, 1915, appeared an article with a strong title, China Unconciliatory. The following day, Japan gave the ultimatum concerning the 21 demands presented to China on January 18, 1915. According to the newspaper, China's counter demands were responsible for the situation. But already on that occasion, China demanded a pledge that Sli should be included among the members of the peace conference to be held after the war. And I come to my last point, the Paris Peace Conference. It was a new opportunity for both China and Ireland to revise their position vis-à-vis -vis their colonial and semi-colonial status in the international context. Both countries asked to be taken into consideration. China hoped to see its territorial integrity recognized, while Ireland sought the application of the principle of self-determination to its case. The message to the three nations of the world was an appeal to the world powers convening at Versailles to draw up a first world settlement to recognize Ireland's independence, but its principal target was the American President Woodrow Wilson, because the language was inspired by Wilson's 14 points including self-determination and anti-imperialism. The most prominent American support for Ireland came in April 1919, when the American Commission on Irish Independence was formed to travel to Ireland and Paris to press the Ireland case with President Wilson. At a meeting with Wilson in Paris in that April, they received assurance that he would raise the Irish situation with Lloyd George and was hopeful that the Sinn Féin delegation consisting of de Valera Critic and Count Plackett could be granted passport to travel to Paris, although not to address the peace conference. The Commission proceeded to Ireland for a 10 day visit. Despite the conclusion of the Paris Peace Conference and the Irish Assembly's failure to secure a hearing at it, the campaign for recognition in Europe continued. G.C. Walsh, the American correspondent at the Paris Peace Conference, wrote it in May 1990. 
What has the peace conference got to do with Ireland? It was engaged in dismembering Germany, Austria, Bulgaria and Turkey, in setting up new states in Eastern Europe and in dividing between France, England, Italy and Japan the odds and ends of the former possession of the defeated empires. There was no room for the suggestion that the conference should busy itself with the affair of the victorious nation. There was no door, therefore, through which Ireland could enter and claim a hearing. The peace process was to be implemented by the mutual guarantee of the territorial integrity covered by the Article 10 of the League Convention. Article 10 amounted to a declaration that while the possession of Poland by Germany and Russia, of Bohemia and Croatia by Austria, of Armenia by Turkey were inherently wrong, the possession of Korea by Japan, of Philippines by America, of Morocco by France, of Dodecanese by Italy, of Ireland and Gibraltar by England, always had been right, were right and always would be right. Therefore, the Poles and the Czechs were granted freedom, while the Irish and the Koreans were referred in their subjugation. <coughs> Again, in 1920, Walsh wrote that Ireland had not been justly dealt with, and that opposition went directly to what Mr. Wilson insisted was the heart of the treaty, Article 10 of the League of Nations. However, despite the many sympathizers, sympathizers with the Irish freedom and the support of both democratic and republican parties in the USA, both parties denied the recognition of the Irish Republic. In addition, the British Labour Party endorsing the Irish aspiration did not recognize the duly elected government of the Irish Republic due to international finances reason. The attitude of the British Labour in regard to Ireland is a repetition of its stance on India, except that it was greater. So, in this context, we consider also China which had to resist the Western decision taken at the first peace conference in order to make its voice heard. And then I arrived to my conclusion. China had a great expectation from the Paris Peace Conference. After the proclamation of the armistice on November 11, 1918 and in the war, but the Chinese delegation to the Paris Peace Conference was not fully briefed on what to expect. In fact, the chief Japanese delegate announced in early 1970 that in return for Japanese naval assistance against Germany, Great Britain, France and Italy had signed a secret treaty ensuring support of Japan's claim in regard to the disposal of Germany's rights in Shantou after the war. The Japanese also announced that they had come to secret agreements with Tan Chinri in September 1918 while he was still pregnant. A faction premier and president who, before resigning one month late in October, had agreed huge Japanese loans to announce his own military power and endorse secret deals with the Japanese. These agreements granted the Japanese the right to station police and to establish military garrison in Jinan and Qingdao, and mortgage to Japan in partial payment for its loan to China the total income from two new Shanto railways the Japanese planned to develop. President Wilson, who had earlier been sympathetic to China's desire to recover its Shantung rights, now felt that Japan had to stake out a fair claim to them on the basis of international law. On April 30, 1919, he agreed with David Lloyd George of Britain and George Clemens of France to transfer all Germany's Shantung rights to Japan. As the nature of this new betrayal, Grew clear, urgent telegrams flew between Paris and Beijing, and the Chinese public was roused as rarely before. China delegates at Paris were bombarded by petition and protests from political and commercial groups, from overseas Chinese communities, and from Chinese students at universities abroad. On May 1st, the news reached Beijing that the Chinese delegates acknowledged their case as hopeless because of the prior agreements. This news triggered mass protests in Beijing on May 4th, that is the picture, <coughs> which were followed by demonstrations in cities all over China. While the government is there, pressure on the Versailles delegates not to sign the treaty was unrelenting. With typical indecision, the Chinese president did at last telegraph an instruction not to sign, but the telegram was sent too late to reach Versailles before the June 28th deadline. Yet, 
Chinese students and demonstrators, by surrounding their nation delegation in the Paris Hotel, forcibly prevented the delegates from attending the signing ceremonies. The Versailles Treaty concluded without Chinese acceptance. On January 20, 1920, China refused the proposal for the retrocession of the Shantung Peninsula rights because it would be the equivalent of accepting the Treaty of Versailles, but instead it resolved to appeal to the League of Nations. The Shantung question was undefinitely settled in February 1922 at the Conference of Limitation of Armament in Washington, where various resolutions regarding China was, were adopted, such as the Chinese Revenue Tariff Treaty and the Nine Powers Treaty with respect to China's integrity. So, in conclusion, the Paris Peace Conference did not solve the problem of either Ireland or China. Coincidentally, both countries had to wait until 1922. In fact, the Eastern Rising had provided an opportunity for a short-lived Irish Republic to be established, but it was not until 1922 that the Irish Free State was formed. At the Conference of Limitation of Armaments in Washington in 1922, China finally settled the issue left pending by the revolution in the world. For Ireland and China, the period between 1911 and 1922 was a tumultuous one. When both countries experienced a revolution or uprising, both struggled to get rid of their semi-colonial or colonial status, both tried to redress the national situation by exploiting the chances offered by World War I, and despite both advocating the self-determination principle, neither country received justice at the Paris Peace Conference. With this, I conclude. Thank you.